For this video, I'll be walking you through how to create your own audio player with custom style, frequency visualizer, and more functionality using web components and the audio contacts API. As always, I have a ton of styling tips, JavaScript tricks, and component best practice to share with you. Support the channel by liking or commenting on this video. Subscribe so you don't miss out on anything. Now, let's dive in. I have here a simple project set up with index HTML where in the head, I have some basic style for the body to center everything as you can see on the left. And as always, I box size border box everything. I also link my player.js file where all the magic will happen. I also have here a audio MP3 file that I'll use to test this implementation. To start, when we want to add audio to the website, we use the audio tag with the source path. This does not actually render anything until you add the controls attribute. The controls look different from browser to browser, and this is how it looks for Chrome 91 I am using. I can play, pause, can control the volume, have info of the playing time and duration, etc. The problem with this is that you can't style it. And if you want to have a consistent audio player look, you must implement some styling tricks I'll show you in a bit. The way I'll style this is by creating my own audio tag with web components so I can also add extra features to it. I'll start by creating a class for the component which I must extend the HTML element object first. And to register my tag, I'll use the custom element object and call the define method passing the name of my tag and the class that will control it a second argument. Now inside my class, I must call super in the constructor. I will also need to initialize my shadow root by calling the attach shadow method in an open mode, which will allow me to see the content on the tag in the browser. This will automatically set up the shadow root element as the shadow root property. I'll create a render method. This method does not have to be called render, but I'm a huge React fan and render has become industry standard. Here I'll access the shadow root property and set the inner HTML, which for now will be our current audio tag from index.html as is. With our render method, I'll call it after attaching shadow. Now in the HTML file, instead of the audio tag, I'll use my audio player tag. If I rerun the project, we see the same audio player as if nothing changed. But if I inspect the page, we can see the audio player and inside we see the shadow root element opened, which its inner HTML is the audio tag we set in the render method. What I like to do in the render is grab reference of every element I need to work with. So I'll use the shadow root to query for the audio tag. Now I'll create another method which I'll use to initialize the audio API. Here I'll instantiate a audio context using audio context class, which will allow me to have a much finer control of the audio. And it is actually the best way to work with audio on the web. Traditionally, developers would interact with the audio tag directly by calling methods and listen to events. We will do that a little, but you can only do so much with that. The audio context API allow us to chain nodes, which expose different capabilities of the audio, like control volume, panning the audio analyzer, etc. It works in three steps, which the first one is to create our audio source by calling create element source and passing the audio element I grabbed the reference of. The second is to attach nodes, but I'll do that later. And the third is to connect to the context destination. For now, I'll call this initialize method from the constructor and to play pause our audio, I'll add a play toggle button, which I'll also grab reference after. And to toggle the play state, I'll create a toggle method where I'll first check if the contact status is suspended and resume it. Since this is an async method, I'll turn this toggle method into an async method so I can await on it. I'll create a property to help track if audio is playing or not. And if it is playing, I'll call the pause method on the audio element, awaiting on it as well and setting playing to false. Then do the opposite on else body calling play instead. Since this is the same button, I'll change the text of the button to play when I pause and to pause when I'm playing. To test this, I'll create another method where I'll attach any element event listener and I'll listen to the click event on the play toggle button. I'll bind this keyboard to the toggle method since I am passing it directly as well. 
Seems like I forgot to check the status on the toggle method here. If I refresh, we can see the button right next to the audio player on the page. I will not forget to call the attach events right after initializing audio. Now when I click, we can see the audio play, but the button did not change. Mm. Ah, it's supposed to be play, pause button and not audio text content. Now I can toggle the audio and the button text change accordingly, which is perfect. I like to focus on having things working by taking care of the logic first before styling them. I'll leave styling for last. The next thing I want to know is the duration and the current time of the audio is playing at, as well as the progress bar. So I'll create a progress bar indicator where inside I'll add a couple of span tag, one for current time and the other for duration. I'll also use a range input tag for the progress bar. There is a HTML progress bar tag, but it requires extra work if I want to know to each time the user jumps to, which the input range already does for me and I don't have to worry about it. I grab reference of the progress indicator and use it to grab reference of inner elements by using the children gatherer. To get the audio duration information, we must listen to the load metadata event on the audio tag. Here I'll log the duration for now as well as the current time. I will also create a dedicated properties for those even though it may be redundant. If I reload and we check the console, we can see that the current time and duration and all this is in seconds, which means some calculation is required to get the right time measurements. I'll assign duration and set the max on the progress bar with that duration. It is easier to work with seconds for progress bar and convert the value to for display only. To get the seconds from this, I'll pass the duration modded by 60. The 10 here is just to tell the parse int to parse it with the base of 10, the radix. And for minutes, I'll do the same thing, but I'll have to divide the duration by 60. 60 here is how many seconds there is in a minute. So if we have 120 seconds and divide it by 60, we would get two minutes. The mod by 60 would give us the remainder in seconds. So if I have 125 seconds and divide it by 60, we would get two minutes and five seconds remainder. Now that we know the duration in minutes and seconds, we can update the duration element text content separated by a column. If I reload here, we see the progress bar and that this auto is two minutes and 51 seconds long. And my calculation matches the auto tag as well. So now we need to track the current time as the auto is playing and update the current time as well doing the same calculation. To track audio play time, we need to listen to time update event where I'll call a yet to create update audio time method where I'll first update the current time property and the value of the progress bar. I'll copy the duration calculation over. I have to pad seconds with an extra zero. So when the seconds is between zero and nine, it shows with a zero in front. Now I can update current time element text content with this info. If I reload and check the page, oops, I need to use the time and not duration for current time here. Now, when I play, we see the seconds ticking with the correct time. Perfect. Before I continue, I'll go ahead and remove all your controls and hide it with display none since we will be showing our own style. Now that we know how you're playing progress in time, what we need to do is seek to a different time when the user clicks anywhere on this progress bar. To do that, I'll listen to an input event on the progress bar, which is our range input. I'll then create a seek to method, which I'll call with a progress current value, which will be in seconds. Now in the seek to method, all I'll do is update the audio current time. Now, when I play and click on the bar, the audio seeks to that time and continues to play. For the final touch, we need to handle the state when the audio is done playing. And for that, I'll listen to the ended event to reset the playing state to false and update the button label. Now, to control the volume, we'll go back to the audio contacts to create our gain node, which will give us control over the volume of the audio. 
With the gain node, I can just connect to the source before connecting to the destination. And now I have control over the gain of the node. The gain node volume ranges from 0 to 2, where 1 is 100% of the volume and 2 is double the volume. I will initialize our initial volume to 0 0.4 so it's low enough to not scare anyone at first. Now for the volume bar, I'll have a div with another input range, which the max value here is 2. And I'll make sure it increments in steps of 0 0.1 by specifying the step attribute. The value is the current volume. Now I'll get reference of the element field. We'll then listen to input event on it as well and call a yet to create change volume method where I'll use the range field volume to update the volume property. Then update the gain node value with the volume and that's all for volume for now. Now if I try this on the browser, I can easily control the volume now. Nice. With that, I have pretty much replicated all the default audio player functionalities, but I want to visualize the frequency as the audio is playing with something nice. To do that, we need the analyzer node, which I'll then connect to the source as well. For analyzer node, I want to specify the FF size, which stands for Fast Fourier Transform, which is an algorithm. And I am simply specifying the size of it. The analyzer provides us with frequency data that we can use to render something nice. Next, I'll get the buffer length with frequency bin count, which is the number of data values I'll have available to display. Next, I'll use that to create our 8-bit unsigned array. And with this array, I'll finally be able to get the frequency data. To visualize this data, I'll use a canvas, which I'll then grab reference of. Now I can create a update frequency method to handle that. So pay attention very closely now for this explanation. This method will be called a lot, and I only want this to happen when audio is playing. So I'll call when we toggle play. A log here so you have an idea of how often it will be called. And this is because our request animation frame to call this function again at the same rate your monitor is refreshing, which is normally 60 times a second or more. If I click play, we can see the count. So what I'll do is if it is playing, I'll quit the function early. Now when I play, it gets called and when I pause, it stops. This will make sure I am not constantly calculating the frequency data and updating canvas when the audio is just sitting there on the page. Now I'll make sure the canvas has some dimension and 20 pixels tall is enough for this. Inside this function, I'll make sure I update my frequency data, which can be an array of hundreds of values. First thing we need when working with canvas is the context. And for this, we will need the 2D context. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do 3D video tutorials on the channel and make sure you are subscribed. Working with canvas is just like painting. This is the best analogy I can give you. First, we dip the brush into paint and for this one, I'll make it red. Then we define the shape we want to paint. And for this, it will be a rectangle start at 0x and y position with the width of the same of the canvas, pretty much the size of the canvas. If I refresh, we can see that the entire canvas is now painted red. If I divide the width by two, it will paint half of the canvas. Now that you know what this code is doing, I'll make it transparent black by specifying the alpha of zero. I want to create vertical bars. So first I'll define my bar width and the gap I want in between the bars. Now I need to know how many bars I'll display and I'll do that by dividing the buffer length by the bar plus gap, and since I don't want the last gap at the end, I'll subtract one gap. Now that I know how many bars to display, I'll define my X zero, where X is the X coordinate, the X position of each bar, which I'll increment by a bar and a gap for the next bar to be drawn. Again, for each bar, I'll dip my brush into paint, in this case, black, and then define the shape to draw only this time the X position is the X value we have. The Y can be zero for now. 
the width will be the bar width and for the height i'll hard code it to be 10 for now if i refresh we can see the bars but they are at the top and this is because the canvas zero x and y coordinate is the top left corner to flip it to the bottom we can subtract the height from the canvas height now i'll calculate the height of the bar by using index to access the frequency which will be a number between 0 and 255 time it by 100 and divide it by 255. this formula is based on logic where if 255 is the max value of the frequency it represents 100 percent of the value therefore any value at data array index will be x from here we cross and multiply which give us x times 255 equal to value at index time 100 percent which we can resolve for x giving us value at index times 100 divided by 255. The result will be the percentage this frequency value represents from 0 to 255. Next, we need the pixel value relative to the canvas size, which we use the same logic to arrive at percentage times the canvas height divided by 100. We can plug this value for height now and click play to see the bars representing the frequency. It may not be obvious, but what it is doing is adding layer of bars on top of each other because this function is called over and over. So it paints over and over on top of the previous painted stuff. To avoid that, every time this function is called, I'll need to clear what was previously painted before I paint bars again in a new state. I can do that with the clear rect method passing top left corner coordinates and the canvas size so it clears the whole canvas. Now, if I refresh and play again, we see the bars as they should be. Let me make it more fun with color. One nice coincidence is that frequency values go from 0 to 255, and the color values are the same. So I'll use the frequency to pick the red value of the color, and I can pick a random value for green and blue. We got some green result here we can play with and value a little more and now we got a purple range i like this better with that we can move on to even more interesting tag handling so one thing we are not handling is attributes for example the audio source is provided inside and ideally this is provided to the tag so i'll move it to the tag instead because this is custom i can provide something like the title which is an attribute the audio tag does not support Inside the component, I can tell this component which attributes I'm interested in watching. Source and title are a good one, but also the audio tag takes a few attributes, but I don't need to support all of them. For example, I don't need to support the controls attribute because this audio player always provide a control. But I can support others like muted, cross origin, loop, and preload, which are a reasonable attribute for this. Now, to get the attributes update, I need to set the attribute change lifecycle listener, which is called with three values, the name of the attribute, the old and the new value, which I can log here. And we can see that this function is called from the start. And a good thing to know is that at first, the order of attributes on the tag matters. That's why we see source, then the title logs. So one thing I want to do is track whether the audio has been initialized or not. And this is because the audio context will throw an error if we initialize the audio again, which can happen when the source attribute value is replaced dynamically with JavaScript. So when the source is received, I'll set initialize to false and re-render the entire component so we get a new audio tag to initialize. Then we can check if it is not initialized yet and initialize it from here. Also, we can quit early if the audio is already initialized. I'll also call attach events from here as well. I could call it from the render method, which could be much better, actually. Also, if the source changes and the current one is playing, I make sure to pause it first. Just so you have an idea of the error I told you about, we see it here saying the auto elements are already connected. This error is happening because I never set initialize to true, and this is trying to initialize it on both attribute updates. With that fixed, I'll add the title and the best way to title your audio tag is with the figure tag. Devs often think that the figure tag is for images, but actually figure tag is to group tags which together form one thing. So you can use it to caption images, code, quotes, audio, etc. I'll use fig caption to render the title here. 
title will be untitled by default and in the attribute update callback I'll check for the title and set it i also get a ref of the fig caption element and update it as well Now we see the title in the page there. So for all other audio related attributes, I'll loop over the attributes and grab it and then check if you are specified. This is just to make sure that the attribute was in explicitly specified in the HTML code or by some script. Then I go ahead and set it on the internal audio tag. For here, I'm just adding attributes. So I'm not handling uh, removal of attributes, but I updated this in the code in the description that I leave for you. So we don't have to focus too much on that explanation and can move on for now. This should cover it all. There is one feature I need to handle, which is the ability to mute on click, but it will make more sense if I style the audio player first. For the style, I'll set a style method and return a string containing the style tag where I'll place all the CSS. Now, before our figure tag, I'll call the style method and set the style. First thing I'll do is make sure the host, the actual audio player tag, size 100% of the available width, but only up to 400 pixels with any sensory available font. I'll also make sure to box size, border box, everything inside. Now for the outer player, I'll define dark background, rounded corners and white tags, some padding and display flex to show things in a row side by side. Vertically align things with align item center, relative position for some stuff later and add some bottom margin because I want to place the title below. Now for the title, I'll absolute position it all the way to the bottom with top 100% plus two pixels for a small gap. Inherit the background, which is the dark background, 100% width, left zero and add some padding and 12 pixels font size and capitalize text. Wrap it up with no margin and rounded corners. Just so I can focus on the right thing, I'll hide the volume field and force the progress bar to take full available space. I'll also move canvas inside the progress and cater container. You'll see why in a little. For the play button, I'll make it 30 by 30 with mint width of 30 as well so it does not get squished by progress indicator trying to take as much available space as possible. A random background, remove appearance, no border, indent all the tags away because I want to show an icon instead and to make it work, I'll need to hide overflow as well. The volume button also shares the dimensions of the play button. And I'll position the volume field absolute center and appear on hover only. I am utilizing the volume field container as a button here. Now for the progress indicator, I'll display flex and push everything to the right with flex and justify content. Align item vertically with align items center. Position relative because I'll position the canvas and the progress bar absolute here. With those absolute, we can see the time elements on the right. I'll hide canvas and the progress bar for now. For the time elements, I'll Z index it to one, and positioning it relative for it to work. And the goal here is to make the canvas stay all the way back, the time element on top and the progress on top of everything. You will understand more as I go. Some margin for duration to distance it from the volume and current time element. I'll also introduce a forward slash bar in front of the duration element with the before pseudo element. I went ahead and created an icon sprite with all icons I'll need for this. It is a PNG split in equally five parts with five icons. I'll go ahead and use it for play button position left zero and vertically aligned center. The size of this image is 500%. Remember these five icons in one image. The height is 100% and no repeat. With that, we can see the play button and the way this works is that the button is 30 by 30 and 30 is the 100% size. And since the image is 500% wide, we only show the one part of it, the one fifth of the image. And we control the icon we show with the left position, which is set here to zero. I'll do the same for the volume, but for the volume, I need to shift the X position. And since the icon I want to show is the third one, I'll set horizontal position to 50%. For the first icon, the X is zero, Second is 25%, 
third is 50%, fourth is 75%, and last one is 100%. To show the pause icon, I need a class on a button for when it is playing and set the same background, but at 35% X position since the pause is the second icon. Now, when I toggle play, in addition to changing the content, I'll also toggle the playing class on the button. If I play now, we see the pause icon, and when I pause, we see the play icon. For the volume, I need the same kind of class for different levels, so I can switch the icons. And for now, when the volume is more than one, meaning more than 100%, I'll update the volume bar class to contain the over class. And if it's more than zero, I'll add half to the class, else it is muted, so I'll use that as default. I'll also call to change volume from initialize and reinforce the volume at 0.4 every time we initialize. Now I'll target those volume class and set the appropriate icons. I'll style the progress bar, so I'll show it first with 100% and no appearance as well, and we get white bar. I'll fill height as well. I really don't want this thumb, and what I want instead is the filling bar, but for that, I'll need to hack this a little. I'll remove the background first, then target the thumb with WebKit slider thumb and moss range thumb as well. First, I'll remove the appearance and set 20 pixels height, which is the height of the bar, really. No width, so we don't see it. And, and the trick I'll use is the box shadow trick. I'll make the X offset negative 300 because I'll make the shadow 300. The reason I picked 300 is because the audio player max size is 400. When I subtract the padding and the size of the volume and play button, 300 is roughly enough. I could play safe and set it to 100 view width, for example, but this is enough. With that, we can see it is red, but it comes out a lot. And to hide it, I'll hide the overflow on the bar itself. Now when I play, we see the red bar filling. Pretty nice. I can also click anywhere and see it fill up as well. I'll change it to a semi-transparent white because I want to place the canvas behind it so we can see it. So I'll copy the same style for the Mozilla browser as well. Before I move to the canvas, I'll make sure to center it by shifting it up in the Y axis. I'll do the same centering for the canvas and display it as well. With that, it looks final. but I'll make it semi-transparent at 40% so it doesn't overwhelm the progress bar. I am not done yet, but what do you think? Like it? Show me your support with a like or leave a comment. The final thing I want is to deal with the mute capability. First, I'll make sure the field is on top of everything. I'll force show it so I can style it. Now I'll remove the appearance, 20 pixels height, rounded corners, and white background. For the thumb, 20 pixels height as well, 20 pixels width and purple background. I'll duplicate the style for the Mozilla thumb as well. With the volume bar style, what I want to, what I want to do is when I click the volume button, for it to toggle mute on and off. Now when the mute attribute get updated, I'll update the volume bar value and the volume property as well. Now I'll have a toggle mute method and check on the muted attribute and set it to zero, otherwise use the previous volume. Now on when I set the volume, I'll update the previous volume with the current volume before I update the volume with a new value. I can also do the same inside the render as well as initialize method. Now I'll listen to click event and make sure the click happen on the volume bar and not on the field by checking the target element. Since that is our brand, I can call the toggle mute. Since like something is wrong, it's supposed to be volume bar instead of volume. Since like setting the volume in initialize is a bad idea and I'll actually use the current volume instead. And for that, I'll make sure the volume is a number when I set it as well. Now toggle mute works just as expected. Now for the final check, I'll set the muted attribute and the volume icon change to muted. I can go ahead and set the loop attribute and let the music finish to see if restarts. And it does. I'll set the preload as well as cross origin and off anonymous. Like that, the player is complete. Let me know what you think in the comments. Like this video to support the channel. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on anything. Grab the code by checking the link in the description. Once again, thanks for watching. Catch you in the next one. Bye bye.